Well, as fire season starts to get really ramping up here, it's hard not to think back to the campfire or the Tubbs fire. When those fires started and spread so quickly, people just quite frankly didn't have a chance to get out. It's a scary thing to be a forecaster and go through something like that where you realize, did I do enough to prepare people? Did I give them the best short-term, long-range, uh, seasonal outlook? Some of which really isn't that accessible and available at this point. After the Tubbs fire, I actually did some work with the National Weather Service and did some reporting just asking the questions, do we need a better warning system, something like a tornado warning system where these big loud sirens would be going off? Would that have helped? Some of them have been decommissioned and there needs to be a whole restructuring of our warning system. And one of the key factors too is that we realize that the red flag warnings that we have been issuing or they have been issuing and we've been talking about for years kind of just becomes background noise. So how are we delivering that information? And do we really have the tools to get people the information that they need? Being, what what is their risk factor? Are they in an area that is highly prone to these wildfires? Because you gotta remember, many people are starting to move out of the valley into the foothills, into areas that are really at risk for these catastrophic wildfires. We just have a lot more population up there. Not to mention, we also have this fire migration of large scale wildfires starting to move out of Southern California into Northern California. I was talking with Cal Fire a couple of years ago and they said, in Southern California, it's pretty predictable. You get these Santa Ana winds, these easterly winds, they blow through off to the ocean and the direction of these fires are, I don't want to say completely predictable, but a bit more than Northern California when you can get more erratic winds. Not to mention that our fuel is much different and it burns much differently. We have a wide variety of fuel in the Northern part of California. These types of things are now playing into how do we assess fire risk? How are firefighters going to treat fire behavior, look at fire behavior and be able to contain these fires to keep it away from the growing population that is merging that urban and wildland interface. One researcher that I was able to talk to is starting to develop a project and it's funded by the National Science Foundation to assess that risk and go beyond just the numbers. He wants to bring in the short-term, long-range seasonal forecasts as well as mitigation. How can we potentially protect and prevent these wildfires from starting and maintain our forest? We don't want to just chop down all the trees and clear all the brush. We still need that. I mean, these are great carbon uh, absorbers, so we definitely want to keep all of that green land. Uh, his name is Hamed Ebrahimian, and by trade, he's actually an engineer. He deals more with uh, more with earthquakes and structural engineering. So, so my name is Hamed Ebrahimian. I'm an assistant professor at the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Nevada, Reno. He was so moved by the campfire, he thought to himself, "I've I've got to do more." I, and I, I have the science background in the structural part of it. I'm very interested in science, but I, I need the help of some people that have the atmospheric science, the uh, wildland uh, fire behavior knowledge, and he brought together a group of researchers. And so what they're doing now is to take it beyond just the risk factor. The main idea is to collect data from many different sources. And we have different sources that can provide data on different aspects of this wildfire. You know, it's a complex system. It depends on a lot of contributing factors. So uh, we have, uh, we are gonna gather data from satellites, from drones, uh, from uh, uh, weather stations and integrate all this data, but data itself cannot give us a lot of uh, what we call actionable knowledge. Mm -hmm. What we are going to supplement this data is, is with models and computational models that kind of are going to be trained with this data and also help us to predict what is going on in the future, actually. So a combination of collecting different sources of data and mixing them with the computational model is, is basically what we can say as the novelty of our work that we are going to uh, offer. Look at the socioeconomic impact as well. What is the economic impact? What is the human, um, the human impact? 
How will a community be able to recover? And that then will play into the risk factor. Can a community recover quickly? Is it going to take some time? Many people, when they lose their home or they lose their uh, loved ones, these impacts will linger in the community for a long time and it happens. And we want to understand really what are these impacts, how we can quantify them. And when I talk about the risk of wildfire, risk is the likelihood of loss. And that loss has a very profound meaning into it. It's not only monetary damage or losing houses, it's only how it will affect the quality of people's life. Mm -hmm. How long would it take for a community to rebound from these effects, you know, and, and get back to normal? And this is a very broad idea, you know, it's a humanistic subject. It depends on a lot of factors in the economy, lo local economy, regional economy. So that's why there might be some very small town at some uh, middle of some uh, forestry area, but that small town will have a strong impact on if it gets affected. So we want to kind of encounter and take into account all this risk, all these effects, in really quantifying what I call risk, you know. It's right. not only direct monetary loss, it's how people's human life will be impacted. They're using drones, satellites, uh, interviews from people that have been on the ground fighting wildfires in different areas. Now, this is not going to be a short-term project. This We're talking five years is how long it's funded for. I asked, I asked him, a, I said, uh, so when can we possibly see some results from this in a mapping sort of visual display? And he kind of laughed and he said, well, we're funded for five years. <laughs> so hopefully in that time span, we'll be able to create something. But because they're using so many different layers to go into the risk factor, it's not just, oh, you live on a hillside and your um, brush gets very dried out. Your grasses get very dried out during this part of the season. Your risk goes up. Really combining many layers to developing this risk category. And hopefully that will give people a better idea of how to prepare for where they live. So the data will be transferred to what we call actually a product, an information product that makes sense for the decision makers, for people that are using. So imagine that uh, you have a map, a digital map, that is, uh, is dynamically being updated with data on the behind the scene as they've been collected. And this digital map is color coded and it shows different area and region based on the risk of fire that we expect, for example, uh, weeks ahead or seasons ahead, okay? And this, uh, not only we can estimate and we want to estimate the risk of fire at different area, but also we wanna de-aggregate the contributing factors that are uh, adding to that risk meaning that if we want to reduce the risk of fire in a certain area, what are the preventive action that we can take right now in order to go in the land and, and kind of cut some bushes or do some something? So uh, estimating, identifying or estimating the risk and identifying the contributing factors to that risk is basically what we are trying to do. And this will provide what we call actionable information that if you want to do a preventive measure right now, a preventive action right now in a certain area that we see has a high risk of fire happening weeks ahead from now, what are the first things that we can do with our limited resources and time to reduce that risk scientifically? Another aspect of our work is on post-ignition, you know, when a fire has started. So, and then when the fire has started, everything should be focused on how we can control it and suppress it, you know? And, and kind of uh, what decision there is a lot of certain sort of decision that should be made at that point in order to evacuate people or to take proper suppression action. And fires, because these are very complex systems, they behave in a very complex way. It mm -hmm. depends on a lot of factors. So understanding all this, a lot of uh, all these different factors and predicting how the fire is going to behave, for example, one hour from now or two hours from now or one day from now. This will provide a, what we call a very critical knowledge that can be used for decision makers on the ground, you know, ground zero firefighters, to how to better manage the effort to reduce the uh, damage on the life, on the people's asset, 
and or uh, or improve the suppression effort. Keep in mind, though, that changes every year as we get into this drier, warmer environment. And we've seen, as I mentioned just a moment ago, how that behavior, that fire behavior is moving its way into Northern California in terms of larger scaled wildfires. So that's exactly our objective in order to integrate models with data, with different sources of data that we get. And through this integration, the models will learn from the data as, as how this fire has behaved so far and how it's going to behave likely this point forward. At first, with the Tubbs fire, not because it was a wildfire, we, we, we get wildfires all the time, but just how many people died in that. And we said never again. And it was about a year later, we had the campfire. Um, that can't continue to go on. We know that. Uh, so how, how do we start addressing it? There's so many debates out there. Is it mitigation? Is it uh, clearing? of some of the uh, some of the brush some of the trees we've got a we've got a big infestation of the bark beetle which is in parts of the central sierra kind of pushing its way through the sierra and basically what that is is it's a little bug that embeds itself into the trees and kills them the first time i saw this i looked out and i went oh my gosh those did those get burned out because it looked like they were just dead trees from being hit by a previous wildfire maybe a year or two prior and the person that i was talk to, talking to lived up in uh, a place called groveland it's not too far from yosemite and he said no that's the bark beetle he said come here let me show you and he showed me some of these dead trees from the bark beetle he said that's all on my property he goes i can't afford to clear all that and it just jumps from one tree to the next so it becomes all these little matchsticks that are up in the foothills and in the sierra that's just ready to go because they have no moisture left to it. These are, these are dead trees, essentially. So we definitely have a growing problem and uh, really excited for this research project to take off and hoping that uh, him and his researchers can come up with a product that will save lives, save property, and give us a better understanding of the environment in which we are living.